Welcome to The Lead, the New Lines magazine podcast. I'm Amy Ferris Rotman, and this is a podcast where we delve into the biggest ideas, events, and personalities from around the world. Our guest today is Julia Yoffe, who is founding partner and Washington correspondent for Puck, a media company. She's also former Moscow correspondent for The New Yorker, Foreign Policy, and has written for The Atlantic, The New Republic, The New York Times Magazine, and many others. It's been more than seven months since Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine. The war in Ukraine and the situation in Russia are grabbing more headlines than usual. President Vladimir Putin's mobilization order on September 21st has shaken the world, but more importantly, Russia itself. We are witnessing mass protests against the military call-up across the country, from the glittering cities of Moscow and St. Petersburg to the turbulent, mostly Muslim North Caucasus, and even to remote Yakutia in the Far East. Julia Yoffe, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Amy. So we are seeing what feels like a cataclysmic change, a, a, an epic moment in time when, when it comes to Russia. W would you agree with this, Julia? It certainly feels that way. You know, it feels like Russia is losing the war and that it's trying to throw everything at it. Um, a war that was completely unjustified, unprovoked, and was a terrible mistake based on very, um, shall we say, stupid mis miscalculations. And now that the war uh, is very clearly going Ukraine's way, Putin started basically throwing cannon fodder at it. And uh, Russians, especially Russian men, understood that very clearly and are voting with their feet. Um, the fact that you can see traffic jams from space piling up at the borders at the checkpoints to Georgia, for example, that you can see these lines from space that they're stretching for 20, 30 kilometers, uh, that people are crossing, you know, dropping their cars and crossing on foot or on scooters, that people are buying $10,000 uh, plane tickets just to get out and not have to serve in this war and not be party to this uh, war that maybe they didn't actively oppose and go out into the streets to protest because it is so dangerous, but they certainly don't want to be a part of it. And then you're also seeing, uh, you know, the people who are too poor to get in a car and drive and start a life somewhere else, or too poor to get a $10,000 ticket to Istanbul, torching, literally throwing Molotov cocktails at military recruitment points or breaking their own legs to you know, doing anything they can to get out of military service. Um, we're seeing this veneer of patriotism that Putin has presented to the world by showing us polls and um, parades and rallies that, you know, showing us that Russians support this war that he's cooked up in Ukraine. We're mm -hmm. seeing it vanish literally overnight. Yeah, you said there's, there's lines that you can see from space. I've been reading reports that there are up to 5,000 Russians a day trying to get into Georgia at the moment. I mean, do, do they know something? Do they know that this could be the beginning of the end of Russia as we know it? I think it's more immediate than that. I think it's people who don't want to fight in this war. I think it was one thing when it was happening far away. Uh, I kind of compare it to the way Americans behaved you know, during the time when America was fighting two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. If you went into the West Village in 2006, 2007, you wouldn't know that uh, America was fighting a totally unnecessary, costly, bloody war in Iraq. Um, but that was in fact the case. And in the same in the same way, if you were in Moscow this past summer, you wouldn't know that Russia was fighting a costly, bloody and totally unnecessary war in Ukraine. Uh, it was easy for Russians to push it off to the edge of their minds. But now it has come home to them. Last week, exactly a week ago, on September 21st, Putin announced what he said was a partial mobilization, and he said he was calling up 300,000 people, and it seems about that amount has fled the country uh, in just the first few days since he made that announcement. That number of men mm -hmm. has fled the country because 
you know, when nothing was asked of them, Russians were fine to kind of close their eyes and go along with it. But when they're asked to actively participate in the war and asked to go into the trenches themselves, um, they don't, they don't want to take part in it. And I'm, I'm sure there's something we get into given your background, but it's been fascinating to see the, um, the regions of Russia that are protesting, right? The kind of the ethnic yep. enclaves of Russia and specifically the Muslim regions of Russia, the way they're fighting back. And, uh, you know, you see people fleeing other parts of Russia, but these areas are just really pushing back hard. That brings me to my next question, because I, I mean, you, you can see emotionally and tactically to a point why Putin ordered the mobilization. I mean, he's been humiliated by by how well Ukraine is doing. We, we saw we saw this lightning counteroffensive in the Kharkiv region that must have been especially difficult for him to stomach when Ukraine recaptured over three thousand square miles of territory in a little over a week. But like you say, th this mobilization order. Um, it's it's produced this mass exodus. It's produced loads and loads of protests. So I wonder, has he has he gone a step too far? Are, are we seeing him lose his grip on reality? It seems like he's lose lost his grip on the country. Uh, it seems like he's losing his grip on on kind of everything. He doesn't look as strong as he used to. I mean, I thought it was so interesting uh, when he went to the. Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit uh, in Uzbekistan a couple of weeks ago, and it was right after Ukraine started its offensive, right? And this country that he doesn't think is a real country, he thinks uh, Ukrainians are made-up people with a made-up culture and a made-up language, are suddenly driving his what he thought was a mighty army, and he was trying mm -hmm. to present to the world as a mighty army, suddenly pushing them back and winning back more territory in day. I think it was something like they won back more territory in five to six days than Russia won in five months. Right. And then he shows up at the summit and I feel like Russian and kind of Russian racism plays a, played a big role in that. Right. He shows up at this summit with leaders of former Soviet republics uh, people that he clearly looks down on, <clears throat> both politically, geo like geopolitically, and I think ethnically and racially. And he's stuck waiting for them. They're pulling his old power play on him, right? Um, because mm -hmm. all these strongman leaders, including Xi Jinping of China and Narendra Modi, um, are chiding him both privately and publicly uh, and telling him that what he's doing is wrong and that he needs to wrap up this war and they're disrespecting him publicly because these strongman leaders of these other countries, um, they don't respect him anymore. Like he, he looks weak. Mm -hmm. He looks he, really weak. He, he looks very weak. This army that he told the world was going to roll Ukraine in three days. Can't even take the Donbass. You know, it, they, they're, They've lost 50% of their tanks in less than a year. They're, they seem to be completely incompetent. He tries to call up a draft, and at, as many people as he tried to call up leave the country in less than a week. And it's suddenly, you suddenly realize the emperor has no clothes, and it's the worst thing, I think, that can happen to a strongman autocrat is for people to realize that maybe his hold on power is not so strong, that maybe he's not um, not as fearsome as he wanted us to believe. Yeah, I mean, what I find particularly um, scary about his his hold on power or his his lack of a hold on power is what you referred to earlier, which is the North Caucasus. Um, I mean, this is Russia's Achilles heel. It, the 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 string of southern republics which are mostly muslim which have a long history of battling for independence from moscow and we've seen really fierce mm -hmm. yeah protesting coming out of dagestan even out of chechnya which where ramzan kadyrov rules mm -hmm. with a with an iron fist i mean yeah what what do you think about that is this 
uh, I think it has the potential to really change things. Yeah. I think from my conversations with people uh, from Chechnya and who know Chechnya, for example, and Dagestan as well, is that the people who went before the before the announcement of the mobilization were people who went voluntarily. They went for money or they were part of Kadyrov's clan and, and his security forces. Um, there was some choice in that. And now people are being drafted against their will and they're being drafted to fight under the Russian flag in a war uh, that is very unpopular with the Chechen population because from what I understand, the Chechen population is quietly very pro-Ukrainian because they know for themselves what it is like to live under quote unquote high accuracy Russian bombs, right? They know what it's like when the when Russian artillery decides to wipe your city off the face of the, of the map, right? Mm-hmm. Like, Grozny looked like Mariupol at one mm-hmm. point. And from what I've heard, the families, the Chechen families that lost fighters or lost soldiers and sons in Ukraine is not, is trying to hide that fact because it's seen as shameful. Um, because they don't, they don't want their sons fighting and dying under this flag. And they don't, you know, like when... Mm-hmm. When Putin really needed them, like they're like they were okay, like the leadership of these republics could get people out to vote in these sham elections and deliver these kind of North Korean levels of um, votes of like 95 percent voting for Putin in the presidential elections, et cetera. But again, when that that's all kind of abstract, right? Um, But when it comes to sending their sons to uh, die for this flag and to die in a war of imperial conquest that they don't approve of because they've been conquered in much the same way Mm -hmm. under the same flag. And for the Chechens, uh, it's some of the same commanders that conquered them, you know, in the second, especially in the second uh, Chechen war. And they want no part in it for obvious reasons. And um, it does feel like the tinderbox, uh, especially that is Chechnya, is starting to heat up. And mm-hmm. I mean, it makes me wonder, seeing the opposition in the North Caucasus, knowing their history, knowing that there's an Islamist insurgency there on top of everything else. Um, it just seems like a really bad move by Putin, really poorly well, judged. Yeah, and I think... I think the other thing that you're seeing, right, you're you're also seeing other regions of Russia protest. You're seeing Yakutia protest. You're seeing the former president of Mongolia trash, I mean, slam Putin publicly for essentially ethnically cleansing Russia because it is the ethnic minorities who are doing most of the fighting and dying in Ukraine and have up until now, right? In, in this, which is so horribly ironic given what this war is it is as as framed by putin and his ideologues and the hardliners around him it is this intra-slavic intra-christian kind of war right he's fighting mm-hmm. for ruski mir the russian world this kind of uh pan-slavic vision of uniting the idea was to unite Belarus and Ukraine and Russia into this pan-Slavic kind of white Christian um, government with Moscow as the seat of power. But Mm -hmm. the people that were doing most of the fighting and dying were people who were not Slavic, people who were not Christian. They were Muslim. They were uh, Buddhist. They were, they didn't look Slavic and they were uh, furthermore they were people who were back home in Russia faced grotesque racism, right? Uh, yeah. They were considered they were considered and treated as second class citizens in Russia, but they were the first ones sent in to die for this vision, right? And I think if before some of them volunteered for the money, mm-hmm. now you're seeing the men and the mothers of these men, especially, say that's enough. And and what I've heard, uh, by the way, from 
people in, in, in Chechnya and Dagestan is this is not our, our war. This is a Christian war and this is not for us. Right. It feels extremely dicey. Yes. Um, yeah. So we are seeing some rare criticism within the upper echelons of the Kremlin. And this kind of opposition is really, really rare. And so it begs the question, are, are we witnessing theatrics? Are things really cracking? Is it possible to even know? But it is rare, isn't it? I agree with all those statements. I mean, you know, as well as anyone that um, it's really hard. This criminology is very hard. And um, sometimes this criticism that, you know, the kind of criticism, for example, that we've seen on state TV from the very, uh, very loyal, extremely hawkish uh, supporters of this war and supporters of Putin has been the very classic kind of criticism that you've seen in Tsarist times and Soviet times, which is uh, the kind that's traditionally called good Tsar, bad boyars, right? Which is, um, oh my God, we're seeing uh, these military recruitment officers calling up old, you know, 68 year old men and how dare they. And, and it's, and the response is, you know, that specific officer needs to be taken out and shot. And at right. no point do they, does the criticism on TV ever rise up to what the hell is the president doing? Right. Right. And, and, and it, and it's limited. Um, but I do wonder I do wonder if right now in the Kremlin, there's a feeling of what the hell is Putin doing? Yeah, exactly. What the hell is he doing? And I get the sense that this is not something that has been asked many times before in the Kremlin. I think it has. I think it has after the sanctions, but it's not been done publicly because it is so risky, right? Um mm. A lot of these people have been kicked out of the West. They have no more lifeline. They're kind of shoved. They've been shoved back to Russia, shoved back in Putin's arms. And even if they weren't, you know, a lot of been a lot of people have been falling out of windows recently, and a lot of people have been committing suicide for no reason recently too, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think people feel that it is physically dangerous to criticize Putin, but in private. And it's also, I think, just difficult to plan anything against against Putin. But it does seem like there's a lot of discontent among the elites. Their, um, their way of life is done. Like they mm -hmm. had it really good going into this war. They managed to carve out um, this very interesting model of kind of internal colonialism, right? Like it was this mm -hmm. feudal lifestyle, right? They made their money off of Russia's natural resources and its people, but they and their families mostly lived and spent their money abroad. But now that's over. And yeah. um, the sand, you know, the ground is disintegrating beneath their feet. And that's all the fault of one person. And they can, I think there, there was some blaming of the West at one point of, you know, of the, of the sanctions, whatever, but I think they know whose fault it really is. And I, and I think at some point, um, especially if things go worse and worse on the battlefield, I think mm -hmm. there has to be a kind of February 1917 moment. And that's usually what happens in Russia. It's the elite that are like, okay, that's enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And generally we find out about it after it's already happened. Right. Gosh. So maybe it, it's happening right now. I mean, that's, that's what maybe. you're saying, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, Russia, I'm just thinking back to when I met you and when I first moved to Russia as a journalist in 2007, um, a year later, you moved. Um, and that, two years, two years. Uh, later. Oh, sorry. It's two years later. Um, a, and a year later, well, in 2008, um, so before you came and shortly after I'd been there, Putin picked a successor, um, Dmitry Medvedev, and uh, we both worked as journalists in Russia when, when he was in control. He was younger than Putin. He spoke English. He loved using his iPad. You know, he was this sort of 
modern western supposedly western leaning leader um and i just think compared to now when we were there at the beginning that really was such a different time wasn't it i mean it seems yeah it, it seems a lot longer than than 15 years yeah it really was in retrospect this kind of brief golden era of thaw and you get those sporadically in Russian history, you know, these little, little moments of thaw before the leadership at the top decides that actually um, too much thaw gives the population the wrong ideas about freedom and, um, uh, and makes them a little too entitled and, and shuts the doors again. But a, a family friend who still lives in Russia, um, I remember when that period ended really firmly with both the uh, crackdown on the pro-democracy protests in 2012 and then the invasion of the first invasion of Ukraine in 2014. And I saw this family friend and he told me this old Russian joke, which was that um, a young man goes to see a priest and he said, and he says to the priest, you know, father, I don't, I don't know what to do. My life is so terrible. My, my wife is sick. The cow is sick and is not producing any milk. And my, my cranky mother-in-law has moved in with me and she just won't let me live. And I, I'm about to lose my job and I have no money in savings and uh, my joints are starting to hurt and my kids are a terror. And I just, my life is just falling apart. And the priest says, don't worry, my son, life kind of goes in phases. First, you get a phase that is shit. And then you get a phase that is varenia, that is like jam. Mm -hmm. And then you get, and then, you know, it goes, in, it goes in stripes. And, uh, and soon, you know, just be patient and soon the next phase will come and, and you'll get an, uh, you'll get a phase that is jam. And he says, okay, father, thank you. And then a year later, this young man runs into the priest again and he says, father, father, I understood that was the phase that was jam, you know, and I just keep thinking about it. That is and, so Russian. And I just keep thinking about how back then we were, we were writing and reporting about corruption and um, lack of media freedoms and lack of investigations about the murders of, of journalists. And yeah, I don't want to say we had complaints because these were all valid and real things, but I, but in retro, you know, and we were, and I remember a lot of people in the private sector in Russia, a lot of expats were like, it's not so bad. Why are you people complaining all the time? We're like, look around. There's no freedom of the press. There's no, look at all this corruption. Everything's dysfunctional. Everything's, you know, the healthcare system is falling apart. The army's falling, everything's falling apart. And now you look back and you're like, that was wonderful. Why were we <laughs> complaining? Oh my God. That is so, that is a really good joke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah no you're completely right i mean it's just um it it felt pretty dark when we i mean it, it felt very fun when we lived there and it was uh, it, moscow was an extremely comfortable and is a beautiful city and we we had a lot of fun but um there there was darkness and of course now um it's gone much 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 darker um yeah. yeah, and I think that, and that life is gone. It's right, over. so, right, right. And I wanted to to ask you about that. I mean, so yeah, I mean, so we were kind of, if we just backtrack a bit, I'm thinking about, so we, three years into Medvedev's kind of so-called rule, and I say so-called because we all know that he was a hand-picked um, successor or for, stand in for Putin while Putin was abiding by his constitution at the time. Um, but there were massive protests against election fraud. Uh, we mm -hmm. covered them together. Um, yep. Alexei Navalny, who you profiled in The New Yorker, who is now in a Siberian prison camp, was out and about. He was leading them on the streets of Moscow. Um, and there were 100,000 people at one point on the streets of Moscow in protest. And I just think, I mean, obviously, these were the days of the jam, <laughs> but um, uh, the jam yeah. you mentioned. But I'm like, this is simply unimaginable now. And mm -hmm. 
the enorm the enormity of 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 what we lived through and covered compared to now I, I just think what on earth has happened and and where are those people where are the russian liberals where where are they now well i think the two are the fact that that happened and the fact that it is now unimaginable are directly related i think that after those protests which uh convulsed Rus uh, moscow and several other big russian cities st petersburg novosibirsk tomsk uh and the and the fact that navalny didn't lead those protests then he was very reluctant to lead them but then he kind of started forming his own political movement and by 2018 uh 2019 whenever he gave the word uh you know hundreds of thousands of people would come out onto the streets not just in moscow and st petersburg and novosibirsk but all over russia and cities big and small across all 11 time zones and the fact that that is now unthinkable was done on purpose and mm. it was it was a very um It was a campaign of, of political terror that started back in 2012 with a crackdown on, on the protesters of, of uh, May 6, 2012, uh, the Balotne protesters, the, you know, many of whom went to jail and had their lives ruined, um, you know, the shutting down, the gradual sh and then very sudden shutting down of the independent press over the last 10 years, I mean, at this point now, there is nothing left of the independent press inside Russia. There is literally nothing left. Everything is either closed and what's left of it, everybody is in exile. Um, in terms of opposition leaders, everybody is in jail or in exile. Um, you know, after a few years of those protests, people were being sent to jail for liking, just liking posts on Facebook, mm -hmm. you know, and once people start going to jail for stuff like that, people very quickly, especially in a place that, you know, where people still have grandparents who were either in the gulag themselves or lost parents or siblings or friends to the gulag, um, where that is still the political terror is still in very recent memory, um, you don't need a lot to scare people back into submission. The historical memory does a lot of that work for you. And it was, um, you know, a lot of new units like the Russian National Guard, Razgvardia, were formed to scare the population back into submission so that the kinds of protests that you and I covered back in 2011, 2012 would never happen again. And so that they would be unthinkable. I mean, I was shocked that, um, when the mobilization was first announced, uh, the the protests that did happen in the main Russian cities were, you know, a hundred people here, sixty people there. They were nothing, right? The the yeah, biggest protests cool. actually were in the Gestan, in Yakutia, in these kind of ethnic republics. Um, the the real protest was the silent one was people voting with their feet right because uh you can't really get arrested for that but yeah or, or although you can be punished right because uh, i've heard reports that they've set up conscription offices along the border yeah but that took them a while right the first few days if you could get out you got out that's true, um, that's true. they were not well the the whole mobilization that was a form was, what, mm. what i'm saying is that became one of the only forms of protest allowed to Russians mm -hmm. was to leave. And I think that was one that suited Putin really well. And you had people who were loyalists to him, people from that circle telling me in the early phases of the war, when we ha saw that first wave of hundreds of thousands of Russians leaving, um, activists, journalists, people who were morally opposed to the war, running especially toward um, Europe and Georgia, Armenia, Turkey, Israel. And they said uh, these people close to Putin and, and the foreign minister were saying this is great because everybody who has left, so these vocally anti-war people have left, and everybody who's left either supports the war or is too scared to speak up. And that suits us perfectly. Unbelievable. I mean, just... <laughs> 
how you could have that sort of viewpoint. Um, it's, ex I mean, it's cynical, but extremely practical. It is practical, but I, I wonder if it can even, if it can, if it can maintain, I mean, that because as the war deepens, as more people die, as more Russians die, as more people are conscripted, surely this dissent will keep, will keep up or keep spreading. Yeah. Don't you think? I mean, I do. It just feels, I don't know. I, I kept thinking about World War I as Putin got ready to invade. And I just kept thinking, you know, if he does this, this will be his Nicholas II moment. You know, the last Tsar, the Tsar who pulled Russia into World War I and paid for it with his throne. And ultimately, Russia paid for it by, um, becoming a, uh, a Soviet country for the next 70 years. But it all kind of unraveled with things like this, with Russia doing very poorly in the war, with, uh, with soldiers not really understanding what they were fighting for, not wanting to fight, and fleeing conscription and deserting en masse. Um, mm -hmm. And the elites uh, feeling like the Tsar was leading them into the abyss and then uh, conspiring to oust him and to push him off the throne, which they did in February of 1917. But yeah, that, that analogy of Nicholas II never left me back in January, February of, of uh, this year. And now I'm, I'm just thinking about it nonstop again. Mm -hmm. Oh, it seems, yeah, uh, it's, we're certainly at a really interesting moment. Um, to put in, it mildly, yeah. To put it mildly, yes. Um, I mean, I just don't understand, what I don't understand is, because we lived there through all these ups and downs, these kind of, you know, uh, openings to the West and then, and then shuttings. And I mean, why, why did Putin want so badly to host the Winter Olympics? I mean, I understand why he wanted, but then why, as soon as it was over, have Russia-backed forces kill people in the center of Kyiv during the Maidan protests? What What is the thinking behind that? Why open yourself up when you have no intention of following it through? Well, I think he thought he was following it through. If you think about uh, 2014 and him uh, ordering Yanukovych to order the um, the... Ukrainian security services to shoot protesters mm -hmm. in Kiev in, in February of 2014. I think the thinking was a, they've spoiled my Olympics. Right. Okay. And now I'm serious. He gets very upset at these things. He got very mad at the liberal pro-democracy protesters who spoiled his third inauguration in May of 2012. Mm -hmm. He gets very upset at these things. And B, he felt like Yanukovych was being too weak and he had let the Maidan protests go too far and that he it was time to crack down, get serious and end them once and for all. Um, right. But in fact, the, the order to start shooting live ammunition at protesters and killing about a hundred of them was actually the thing that accelerated the collapse of the Yanukovych government. I think what we, you know, looking back at um, the 10, 12, 15 years that you and I have been reporting on Russia, Ukraine, and, and the, you know, the former Soviet space, mm -hmm. and, and, and specifically Putin, right? It's, we've been essentially covering Putin and Putin's world. Oh yeah. In, in, in retrospect, it, it kind of, it was all going to end this way. Mm -hmm. Like all the people who said, Oh, he would never, you know, a, a year after you got there, he invaded Georgia. And I remember that moment. I was still living in the U S at the time. And I remember all these analysts saying he would never do that. It, it It's not logical. It wouldn't make sense. It would, it'll mess up his economy. It would uh, mess up his standing geopolitically. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense for him to do that. And then of course he invades Georgia because he is not thinking the way Western analysts are thinking or looking at the situation. He had other goals in mind. He had other plans in mind. And this was always going to be what happened. Like, um, 
he first developed these repressive mechanisms inside the country. Um, and then he exported them gradually outwards. These dictatorships, they never stay inside the country. They always have to expand outwards. And um, it's like, mm -hmm. of course it had to end like this. Like it couldn't have just, because sometimes I, I just think like, okay, yes, he was um, jailing and poisoning dissidents and, and shutting down the media and, and it was terrible. But for the, you know, for the vast majority of Russian people and for pretty much most Ukrainians, life was extremely livable. Mm -hmm. Like, come, come with the Mishala. Like, mm -hmm. why couldn't he have just let it sit, let, let people live? But he couldn't like that's, you know, and it just and it drives me nuts yeah. to think about it. It's just so unfair. It is unfair. And and th I mean, that's the thing after those protests, because um, you, you said how, you know, life, life was pretty comfortable. And it was I mean, after the protests that we covered, uh, the authorities actually dramatically transformed Moscow. Right. I mean, that became on a purpose, sort of, I think. Right. An agreement. Um of, of such right like moscow became this really cool hipster paradise in a way yeah you know i i just keep thinking that right before the war started moscow got like a, a dozen or half a dozen new michelin starred restaurants because the restaurant scene there exploded it was incredible as you and i remember uh and then this past just this past weekend there were reports of Michelin of of chefs at these very Michelin starred restaurants getting pulled off the line and getting draft notices because the army needs to be fed, right? And cooks and doctors are eligible for the draft. So it's like the 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 city became extraordinary. It, it was my favorite city in the world, and I think the Kremlin did that very. Um, it was on purpose. It was on purpose. They bought everybody off. They lulled everybody yeah. out, uh, like into comfort and and luxury and pleasure, so that they would be too satiated to protest. Because Moscow was the city that hated Putin most, that protested the most, and um, and I just remember. I don't know if you remember Kremlin Russia, the you know the satirical. Mm -hmm the satirical Twitter account that tweeted kind of in the voice of the Kremlin. It was supposed to be kind of the id of the Kremlin. And uh, I remember back in 2012, they tweeted, why does everybody keep talking about the stick? We can mess you up with a carrot too. And I, and I feel like that's what the last 10 years were. It was about um, fighting the opposition with the carrot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And you said it was your favorite place in the world. It was my, I lived there for eight years. Um, it was mm -hmm. my favorite city in, the, in yeah. the world too. I mean, it was so beautiful um, and so easy. It had, uh, you know, it became this 24 hour yes. city, yet great food, great arts. Um, we often felt we were sort of on top of the world. And, um, but. And uh, also it became, mm -hmm. I felt in the last, few years before the war, it became an almost a political city because people became so dispirited and they felt that the politics were impossible to change. And uh, people got sick of smashing their head against a brick wall that was never going to give an inch, that they decided to kind of put their energies elsewhere. And as a result, you got this incredible music scene, an incredible art scene, an incredible design scene, an incredible restaurant scene, because people just got tired of putting their energy, an incredible theater scene. Um, yeah. Because, you know, why keep pushing against a wall that's not going to give right and people just kind of decided putin's going to be here forever it's pointless to fight it might as well put our energy somewhere else and moscow is an amazing city let's try to make let's just focus on our lives and and on art um mm -hmm. you know this kind of internal emigration right which is the classic thing that russians do when they feel that they can't change anything global around them they 
They focus on the small things in their lives. Um, and it made Moscow an incredible, an incredible city. And the thing is that I, I, I think that even if we ever do get to go back to Moscow, uh, that Moscow will never exist again. That Moscow is long gone. Yeah. I'm getting very sad now. Um, Sorry. On a, no, honestly, it's just, I mean, what, what do you think the future looks like for that Moscow, the, the one you've just described, the one that was bursting with creativity 10 years from now? I mean, or during the next 10 years? I think that Moscow is mostly in exile right now. I think that Moscow doesn't live in Moscow anymore. That Moscow is in Tbilisi, is in Istanbul, and is in Berlin, in Barcelona, in Paris, in London. Mm -hmm. um, I think that Moscow also has, um, it's in Tel Aviv. I think that Moscow has a lot to think about in terms of um, its responsibility, its kind of collective responsibility for how and whether it allowed this war to happen. Um, it has a lot to think about in terms of helping rebuild Ukraine when this is all over. Right. Um, as well as rebuilding their own lives and rebuilding Russia once this regime is over, because it will end at one point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It will. Uh, yeah. It will, but that is like, you know, building takes a lot longer than destroying. And and what, what, a, what makes me sad is that, you know, this took 30 years to build mm -hmm. after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And you know, how, how long will it take to rebuild a new Moscow, a new Russia after this one collapses? Right. Um, Probably not in our lifetime in, in the way we've seen it. Or it will, but we'll just be very old. <laughs> right. <laughs> the optimistic version in our lifetime, yeah. but at the very end or in a, we won't yeah. be able to stay up till 7am and yeah. Oh, well, I can't do that anymore now. But um, <laughs> but, but, but yes, we, there was a lot of staying up till 7am. I mean, uh, and it was glorious. Um, I must, I mean, I must say, watching Ukraine, um, and for me reporting from there, I've, I've been there twice uh, since the war started. And, and of course, watching the unrest in Russia, and everything we're talking about, and the unraveling of Moscow, um, and watching this diaspora form, um, is deeply upsetting and is pretty much all I think about, all I read, all I want to read. I'm, I'm sure it's the same yeah. for you. Um, yeah, you have family ties there. And um, you've spoken before about losing your motherland twice. So, uh, I mean, could, could you expand on that a little bit? It must be a very lonely feeling. Um. I mean, I, I will say it's nothing compared to what, uh, you know, the residents of Mariupol went through or the, you know, the people who have been bombed in Kherson and Melitopol and Nikolaev and all over Ukraine have been through. And, you know, you, Ukraine by some counts has had, Russia has killed by some counts 30,000 Ukrainian civilians. Um, mm -hmm. and Russia has destroyed countless homes and has created millions of displaced people in, inside Ukraine and millions of refugees outside of Ukraine. And nothing I feel compares to that. Um, right. I have also seen my Russian friends and family lose their, not their physical lives, but their lives as they knew it overnight, you know, having to flee, make the decision to flee in a, in a matter of hours with one bag. Um, you know, they weren't running from bombs like their Ukrainian counterparts, but they were running from arrest. They were running from the draft. Uh, and they didn't have time to think. They didn't have time to plan. They went wherever they could go, wherever they could get a ticket. Uh, and that level of stress and chaos is not something I have ever experienced or, or trauma that I have ever experienced. And also having to do that as an adult and having to rebuild in a new country and a new language um, is not something I've uh, 
thankfully ever had to experience. So I've never, you know, Mm -hmm. what I'm feeling also doesn't compare to that. What I'm feeling is more, you know, I, my family left Moscow when it was still the capital of the Soviet Union. When I was seven, we left as refugees from a country that was pushing us out, had been pushing us out for decades where we were second class citizens. Uh, We were fleeing state sponsored discrimination, but it was also the place. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, But we were also, I was born there. My parents were born there. Their parents were born there. We had lived there for centuries, and um, I grew up, you know, I grew up speaking its language and with mm-hmm. its culture as my culture, and having to restart that, restart my life as a child was was much easier. But you know, I had to re relearn everything, and I still don't feel that I fully. Uh, fit in in the U S um, and now, but then I was able to reestablish a connection with Moscow, with Russia as an adult, I was able to get my Russian language up from where it was at a kind of grade school level back to an adult level. I was able to make my own friends there, have a life there, uh, feel that I had a home there that I could, that it was both my first and second home that I could go there whenever I wanted. And, um, it kind of took some of that trauma of emigration away because I felt like I had reestablished that connection and, um, it was not closed to me and now it is closed to me. Uh, now I don't know when I can ever go back. Um, And I also, you know, there's also family connections there that that you know about that I don't want to get into here, but uh, involving death and burial and that make it extra traumatic. But yeah, the fact that now it's closed to me again, that I can never go back until this regime falls um, is, it's just, it's just sad. It's sad to me. It's, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't have kind of better words for it. It's nothing like the trauma of what Ukrainians are going through or my Russian friends are going through. I'm comfortable and safe and, um, I don't have PTSD, but it's just, it, it feels like the door to my birthplace has been shut to me again. And it's a very strange feeling. Julia Yoffe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for a really great and deep and thoughtful interview. Thank you. You can read more about current events in Russia and Ukraine on our website, newlinesmag.com. You can follow Julia Yoffe on Twitter, at Julia Yoffe, and me, your host, at Amy underscore FR. Julia's book about Russian women, Motherland, will be out late next year, published by Echo, an imprint of HarperCollins. This has been The Lead, the New Lines magazine podcast. This week's episode was produced by Joshua Martin and hosted by me, Amy Ferris Rotman. For more like this, subscribe to The Lead on your favorite podcast app. Thank you all for joining us. This week's episode was produced by Joshua Martin and hosted by me, Amy Ferris Rotman. For more like this, subscribe to The Lead on your favorite podcast app. Thank you all for joining us.